where you talk about <laughs> catastrophe, cliff edge, and uncertainty. Um, but I want to take up from your last point, Marjorie, and uh, we'll have plenty of time. We'll open it up to the audience for questions, but maybe a way to kick us off. Um, where you just ended up talking about the role of business. You know, whether it's 17 days, two to three months, two to 10 years, we are in this phase now of they have shot down a deal, and where do we go from here? What is the role that business can play? And Heather, you mentioned about the US needing to do more. Is there a clearly contingency planning is something for anyone who hasn't already started doing it? <coughs> and I do think I saw a bunch of phones trying to pull up the IBEC toolkit. Um, <laughs> contingency planning is something we've all been doing, will continue to do, and, and manage the uncertainty. Um, but what else could business be doing, or the U.S. be doing, to help drive to a more certain, stable outcome? Is there something business and the U.S. can be doing? Well, I would just say that um, all of our organizations, and as Pat said, many of the business organizations in Europe have been, for the last three years, talking about the need for clarity and certainty, and providing, increasingly providing, real world examples of how, um, in particular, a cliff edge, but even an adjusted relationship, future relationship, would impact um, uh, commercial transactions. Uh, restrictions on trade and goods, services, data, investment, people, um, you know, these are things that, they, this is the lifeblood of, of the private sector, and uh, I think we've been doing a pretty good job of communicating with policymakers, again, on both sides of, of the channel, because it's not just the UK that's making these decisions. Uh, Brussels uh, and the member states have also opted to take a particular uh, position in this debate, and it's, I'm not judging whether it's the right one or the wrong one, it is what it is. Um, but we've been trying to make or encourage policymakers to understand what the practical implications are, and I think, honestly, that's the best thing we can continue to do, because at the end of the day, this is a purely political decision. Um, it was a political decision uh, to hold the referendum in the first place, um, and, and uh, it is the continued sort of, uh, to use a technical term, the political dithering um, that we're seeing in the parliament that leaves us in this very uncertain, uncertain place. But business can only really talk about what we know, uh, which is the potential downsides. I would, I would also say that it's very important at this moment in time uh, for some calmness and cool heads and uh, not going into hysteria about uh, what is happening. And, and from a business perspective, uh, when we have uh, meetings with, with our European colleagues, uh, with our British colleagues, uh, with our American colleagues, uh, we want uh, to support this process and to give a, uh, an orderly exit uh, a chance. And that's really what we're, what we're after here. And if, the, um, if Theresa May and her government uh, do actually request an extension, uh, our view would be that we should give really serious consideration to that extension. But it must have a plan attached to it. And there must be a purpose for it, as, as Janice said. And, uh, we need to uh, to help uh, this process actually arrive at an end point, uh, which we all want, and that is a really good future relationship between the UK and the EU, and between the UK and the United States, uh, and between the UK and Ireland on Irish issues. And we feel that, you know, I refer to the to the to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and one of the things that the Good Friday Agreement does is actually gives a structure for the UK and the British uh, governments to, to meet and sit and talk together. And uh, we have some issues. We have a common travel area, so that's, that predates our, our membership of the EU, so our people will be able to move back and forward between Ireland and the UK. And we need to build on that positivity for the future. So despite the fact that we're in a very difficult situation, this, this week, and the UK Parliament is in an incredibly difficult uh, situation. I think what business needs to do is try to give support to chart a process through this political difficulties to 
arrive at an end point where we all have a good future relationship together. Because the economic and the social <coughs> relationship uh, between Ireland and the UK, uh, between the US and the UK, uh, and also between many parts of Europe and the UK, are so, so strong that for a G7 country uh, to be in a, in a state of, of crisis like this, we need to help uh, to, to arrive at a situation where that G7 country can have a, a workable relationship uh, going into the future and a very positive relationship to all our benefits. Thank you. I, I think, Lisa, I think it's a, it's a really good question and one that is incredibly challenging and hard to answer delicately. So if you'll forgive me, I think I'll be very frank about it instead. Um, first of all, of course, I, I agree with everything that, that Pat and Marjorie has, has said about um, you, you know, business taking a step forward and being very positive about the process, but also being very realistic about it. I think the challenge in all of this is, is a point that Pat made earlier about the fact that you know, the, the UK, as a government, already agreed to what the withdrawal should look like and, and lead to the transition. The challenge became when this was put into the hands of Parliament, it became less a, 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 I think a, a strategic discussion and decision and more of a, a political decision. And I think at that stage, it makes it very difficult for business to come in with really reasonable arguments on economics, on jobs, and livelihood, and to change the, the, the dialogue. Um, I mean, there, there's a handful of people on both the conservative and the labor side who are making this decision even more challenging than it needs to be. I mean, Mark Twain said, people who know the least always know it the loudest. I think we're dealing with a situation that is very similar to that right now. And that makes it really, really challenging. Um, that being said, very important for us to continue to make the, to make the argument that um, investment decisions are being impacted, which means jobs are being impacted, which means the economy is being impacted. Um, and again, I, I have to agree with Pat's last point. I mean, the fact that we're engaging in a crisis like this um, with the UK uh, and the importance that it has on the global financial stage is baffling. <coughs> We've done the year. Right? The hard work is negotiating the free trade agreement. We haven't even started that. Um, so I think it's, it's a difficult position, but we'll continue to make the argument about jobs and livelihood and investment. Well, just very briefly, I think business is completely a victim of both politics and policies. Ask Iowa farmers that uh, are struggling there. Uh, this, is, this is where we, we are today. I think politically, though, business is... Uh, business leaders a, a bit underestimate, I think there is public willingness to pay a price for something very different. And, and that to me is what, as a political analyst, sort of strikes me. Uh, we think very clearly in terms of this is going to harm you. You don't want self-harm. This is economic loss. Well, I think the, the populism of the moment is willing to accept cost. But uh, I think this is where, in some ways, I don't wish ill on anyone, but there was not enough economic consequence from the last three years to try to drive differences of change. It's been softening. It's been a, a distributive uh, way of mass unemployment. Companies now are starting to make some bigger decisions. Maybe if they would have made those uh, a little earlier. The problem is there hasn't been enough pain to inflict different calculus. I would actually argue that here as well from tariffs, but there's a willingness to accept some of that pain and that we have to alter our calculations. So what the US could do, obviously a hypothetical, and, and, a, and it's so easy for me to sit in the easy, comfy chair, Monday morning quarterback, five years of, of mistakes uh, by two administrations. Um, it, we, and you know, the, the quiet, and heavy counsel of not even going down this road. My frustration, if, if the, the then British government would have been worried about the integrity of the United Kingdom and the Good Friday Peace Agreement, you wouldn't have gone down this road before, uh, you, but the politics of that moment were, were too great. Um, then when it happened, good, quiet US diplomacy almost modeled on the George Mitchell model of this is very quiet. The two parties have to decide this. But we need to be there to support when things get rough on one or the side, offer creative solutions, because we lose 
in all of this, but that is not U.S. diplomacy today. So we, uh, in fact, now we're, we put our thumb on, on one side of that scale. So um, that is our frustration, and that is where we are today. Again, we keep getting more and more uplifting. We really want to open up to the audience now for questions. If I could remind everybody to give us your name and your affiliation, and make sure you're actually asking a question. Uh, please let us know if you're directing it to a particular member of the panel, too. Please. Uh, I'm Trisha Pauletta from Harris Fulton and Granite, so I'll try to be uplifting. Um, historically, if a country was trying to leave a political union in the past, there would have been war, right? You know, carnage, mayhem, death, so, you know, we're negotiating over customs and jobs, so, you know, we should be positive about that. Uh, and to tap back into the Mark Twain quote, I probably do know the least of anybody in this room, so let me ask you, with the cliff, like, what is at that bottom? It isn't there, doesn't the EU have MFN duties to the UK? I mean, if, if there's no deal, no agreement, no extension by the 27 members, what does face uh, British entities at the end of that? You know, are, are there customs in place, that, you know, actual tariffs that would be applicable? I guess on the services side, it's far more complex, but on the, on the good side, what is actually at that bottom of the cliff? Thank you. I think the understanding is go to WTO. But then they have to turn around and negotiate. Sorry, we'll share this one. Um, I think the tariff issue is one issue. Uh, but of course, the tariff issue is only part of the issue when you come to leaving uh, the European <coughs> single market. Because uh, there will be tariff costs. I mean, even overnight with the, with the UK's uh, outline there, uh, I mean, our, some of our industries are looking at tens of millions of, uh, of euros in tariffs that they will now have to pay uh, for access to, to, the, to the UK market on the basis of what, of what uh, the, uh, the UK has announced overnight. Um, but in addition to the tariff issues, there are regulatory issues. And uh, whether your, your product actually meet the, the, the regulatory standards of, of participating in, in the in the single market. Now, obviously, UK products today have that regulatory uh, alignment because they're part of the single market, uh, but you have to have mechanisms in place to actually ensure going into the future that that's going to continue to be the case. So it's, it's, the tariff is one issue, but the regulatory alignment, uh, the environmental alignment, uh, is a whole different uh, issue. and, and uh, Thanks very much. I mean, your opening comments was really a great endorsement of, of the European Union because that's what the European Union has done. It has enabled countries to actually work together and to create what is, in effect, uh, the largest and most successful free trade agreement in the world. There are no tariffs, no barriers uh, in terms of movement within the European Union. And when you leave that, uh, that's going to have consequences for, for, for both sides. So it is, it is real. I mean, the, the, the idea that you go to the WTO uh, and MFF tariffs and, uh, and the like, that, that that's not going to have an impact. That's, that's a big, big step change. Yeah, I think, I think Pat's right. It isn't just the tariffs that, that count, but I mean, uh, it, it's the regulatory rule book. It is, I mean, if there's one thing that sticks out for all of my members, uh, it is data flows. Right? Uh, every company today is, if you will, a tech company because every company today depends on data flows, whether it's internal to the company, just, you know, um, uh, moving records uh, of employees, uh, or between uh, business and client, or um, <coughs> data flows to the government, things like that. I mean, so that's really significant. Unless you have an adequacy agreement in place, um, you're going to have a problem. The ability to move people, even on a temporary basis, if you've got somebody uh, employed in the UK, but they're going to do a two, you know, two-month stage somewhere on the continent, your ability to do that is hampered. Um, road haulage. Uh, I mean, we're talking now really <coughs> into the weeds, but uh, there are a certain number of permits available on an annual basis for drivers to be able to drive effectively. Uh, from the UK uh, um, and uh, into into Europe, there will be a dramatically small. There is a small pool 
of these permits that will be made available to, uh, to British road haulers. So suddenly you've now got companies that are going to have to think about, well, wait a minute, if I can't move my stuff, you know, by way of the Dover-Calais um, uh, ferry route, I've got to think about moving my stuff uh, maybe by ship, but through Rotterdam, right? So suddenly you're talking about something, a, a completely different set of circumstances than, uh, than you would. And, and these are things that co some companies have been planning for, um, but others are only just beginning to wrap their brain around. So there are very real world practical consequences that go even beyond just the, the tariff question. Just say one word on the, on the, on the <laughs> data flows. And, uh, we had a, 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 an event on this in, in IBEC a, a couple of weeks ago, and we did it with our data protection commissioner. And I'm sure you, many of you will have heard of GDPR, which is uh, <laughs> data privacy regulation. Uh, and the advice we're giving to all our members is that, that, that um, there won't be an adequacy agreement in place. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a hard exit. Uh, we, we saw how long it took to negotiate the privacy shield with, with the US. Uh, you have to have a similar process with the UK. Um, and so in the absence of that, um, if companies are exchanging data, then they, they have to have one of two things in their contracts. They have to have standard contractual clauses in and these standard contractual clauses cannot just be a reference. They have to get the agreement of both sides in every contract that these clauses are, uh, are accepted. Uh, or they have to have binding corporate rules, which some larger uh, multinational companies uh, might, might have. So you're back to that kind of, uh, of arrangement. And as, as Marjorie said, um, data, uh, data flows across borders is not just an issue for the technology sector. It's an issue for every manufacturing sector, every services sector. Uh, the, the amount of data that flows, not just once across a border, but often multiple times across a border, as simple as paying wages. I mean, we had one company who, who was asked the question that they have their, their, um, their employees uh, check in uh, to work, and uh, they manage their time clocks uh, by fingerprint. And then that fingerprint data is, is sent to, to the UK, then it goes back to Ireland, then it goes to a third party in order to pay the wages and salaries. So that's a, that, that's a complex system if you don't have a, 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 an agreement on how to move that data. So these kind of issues are, are real and real costs for business. And the transport costs are, are, are huge as well, and the license costs of, of who will be able to even drive your truck. And will they have uh, an EU driving license to, to, to drive your truck? through the UK and, and, and on. And this is a big issue for us because we transport so much of our product, not only to the UK, but through the UK to, to, the, rest of, to the rest of Europe. So these, we've had really detailed meetings with our customs and our, and our haulage companies, and uh, it's really, really difficult. And it's really, really costly. Thank you. <laughs> so mental note, if you're planning a summer vacation and taking the Eurostar between London and Paris, International Trade Today. Um, it seems hard to believe that there could be a plan sent over to Brussels uh, associated with an extension, given how directionless things are. So if there is a crash out, uh, whether that's in 17 days or, or a month after that, um, from a practical perspective, if you're a US-based uh, entity exporting to the UK, you know you're going to be dealing with MFN between UK and US, but what is the the uh, mechanism to communicate with the UK what you are sending? Like, is there an electronic <coughs> customs system set up? Like, who are you going to actually tell, I'm a customs broker, here's what I'm sending? Yeah, I, I, I suppose that's a good question to ask the British government. I mean, there, there's no answer right now, and then that, that's a huge challenge. Well, and I, let me just add, I mean, part of 
you know, part of the uh, uh, part of the solution. Uh, let's back up. The backstop, the Irish backstop, that's at the heart of all of this. Um, I mean, to Pat's point, it's a, it's a, it's an indicator of larger concern, but it, it is sort of the flashpoint in the negotiation. The the alternative to having the idea is to never have to invoke right the backstop. So how are you going to avoid that? You're going to avoid that by doing things like making sure you have in place trusted trader schemes and you know, automated <coughs> export uh, licensing systems and things like that. Um, but that stuff isn't, there, there are the technology solutions that would allow you to sustain frictionless trade and avoid uh, um, you know, major blockages at the border and things like that. They're not sort of out there just off the shelf ready to plug in on day on Brexit plus day one. Um, and so I think, uh, to John's point, that there is no, there's no immediate clear answer. And now having said that, uh, the British government uh, has on a daily, if not hourly basis, been issuing notices on every conceivable aspect of trade that you could possibly imagine. Um, you know, how to bring your dog to Europe, how to move goods to Europe, how to deal with the regulatory agency that um, that regulates medical devices. I mean, everything you can think of, these notices have been coming out on a daily basis of what happens if there's no deal and how to deal with it. Um, I, some would argue uh, that, that the government has been, uh, has come to this late. Um, but the fact is, they're churning these things out on a daily basis. Just as uh, Brussels uh, and the member states are churning out guidance on a daily basis, both on um, uh, <coughs> sort of contingency planning in the event of no deal, um, but then also sort of forward planning for what a future relationship might look like. I might just add to that. The production of the guidance notes by the UK government, by the EU, uh, by our own uh, government in Ireland, are helpful in terms of contingency planning. But your question is really valid, and that is, will the actual systems be able to cope with the new arrangements? Um, and that's, that is a real question. That is a really serious question. And uh, the UK and the European <coughs> Union are constantly updating their, their, their customs, uh, software systems, and to make such a dramatic change over a very short period of time, I would have really grave doubts as to whether computer systems are going to be able to cope with that. And then the other point is, I think Marjorie, and our, the, the question that was asked earlier on, and Marjorie made the point about the, about the customs agents maybe having a, a being able to supply uh, SMEs with a service going forward in a new environment. Um, our understanding is that many of those customs agents are saying, well, we won't have the manpower or the capability or the software systems to actually get all those software systems into SMEs in a, over a very short period of time. To have customs agents, physical people, to be able to do uh, to work over a short period of time. And all of this goes back to why an extension of two or three months is not adequate. And therefore you have to have a longer extension of 18 months to two years in order to even let the software systems catch up with the guidance notes on the contingency plan. Just really quickly, look, I, I don't mean to be glib when I say ask the British government. And I, I certainly don't mean to, to not be supportive of the position that they're in, because they're in an impossible position in many ways. Um, they've been doing a heck of a lot to make sure that continuity agreements in the event of a no deal um, have been solidified, uh, and you will have seen the, the news on that as well. But there's a reason that we call this a cliff age and a crash out. I mean, it, it, there, there are no answers to these questions because it's impossible to answer all of these questions at this stage, um, which is why it's a crisis. 